Welcome back to the Accessible Art History YouTube channel. This week's video is another episode in my five must-see masterpieces series. The Musée d'Orsay is a museum with a world-class collection of French Impressionist and Post-Impressionist work. It was difficult to pick only five pieces to talk about, so make sure you head over to Accessible Art History's Instagram page to learn about a bonus sixth work. Plus, you can follow along on Google Arts and Culture, which I've linked in the description box below. The museum has created an augmented reality and street view option so you feel like you're really there. Before I talk about the works though, I think it's important to learn about the history of the Musée d'Orsay. In the scheme of things, the Musée d'Orsay is a fairly young museum. Its stores weren't open until 1986, but the building itself is actually quite a bit older. It was once a train station, opened for service in 1900, and named the Gare d'Orsay. The station was designed by three architects, Lucien Magny, Emily Bernard, and Victor Lalo for the Paris Exposition. It has a magnificent beau art design that makes it a landmark for the city. Today, the Musée d'Orsay is one of the largest museums in the world and receives around 3.6 million visitors each year. Now that I've established some background on the museum itself, let's dive into the work. This first work is by one of the most famous names in art history, Vincent van Gogh. It is called the Church at Avoir and was painted in June of 1890. This was only about a month before the artist tragically ended his own life. I have a whole video about Van Gogh's life and works, I've linked it above and below if you would like to watch it. Van Gogh painted this work as he reflected on his time living in northern France. Those are some of his happiest memories, according to his many letters, and that is reflected in the bright light and rich colors. The expressive, upward brushstrokes lend a certain lightness to this work, which makes the viewer smile. We can almost feel the artist's emotions through this piece. Thankfully, for modern viewers, many of Van Gogh's personal letters survive. I think it's important to read a passage that pertains to his art so we can better understand his mindset behind the creation. This part appears in a letter to his sister, Wilhelmina. Quote, I have a larger picture of the village church, an effect in which the building appears to be violet-hued against a sky of simple deep blue color, pure cobalt. The stained glass windows appear as ultramarine blotches. The roof is violet and partly orange. In the foreground, some green plants in bloom and sand with the pink flow of sunshine in it. And once again, it is nearly the same thing as studies I did in Nguyen of the old tower in the cemetery, only it is probably now the color is more expressive and more sumptuous." End quote. As you can see, his goal for this piece was to showcase the beauty of the region. There is one final interesting fact about this work. At the bottom, there is a split path. Van Gogh painted several of these towards the last days of his life. Was this a sign of things to come? Olympia by Edouard Manet is perhaps the most infamous work in art history. It was painted in 1863, but wasn't put on exhibition until two years later. And when it was finally shown to the public, boy did it cause a stir. Manet took a traditional female nude pose, made famous by Titian's Venus of Urbino, and added a number of shocking details. First was the woman's assertive gaze. She holds the viewer's eye as if challenging them to speak first. This wasn't something typically seen in art, and audiences weren't comfortable with it. Secondly, and perhaps most famously, are the details that show the sitter was a sex worker. Her jewelry, including a black choker, earrings, and a bracelet, the orchid in her hair, and the shawl were all common markers of this profession. Even the title of the works points to this as a sex worker, because they were often called the name Olympia at this point in history. Finally, Manet added a black cat on the right-hand side. In Titian's work, this animal was actually a dog, which represented loyalty, but Manet changed it to represent the night and nighttime activities. These details combined with the harsh lighting and monumental size, something normally reserved for history and mythological works, created a painting that audiences found, quote, immoral and vulgar. Today, we still notice these moments, but instead focused on how Manet changed art. Another work that managed to anger audiences is this one. It is called The Gleaners and was painted by Jean-Francois Mallet in 1857. This piece shows a group of women gleaning, or picking up the stray pieces of hay after a harvest. Millet was part of the realist school, who strove to show life as it really was. The women in this work are performing back-breaking labor, while the massive harvest in the distance were making their bosses very wealthy. Notice the soft haziness in the distance, a precursor to the Impressionist movement. This shows the inequality of French society at the time. Millet's goal was to elicit sympathy, but it had the opposite effect. Its theme and large size made aristocratic audiences nervous, as memories of the two French revolutions were still fresh in their mind. Millet was essentially calling them out. Today, audiences can understand class tensions better through this piece. This next piece is a bit lighter than the last. Ball de Moulin de la Galette was painted by Pierre-Auguste Renoir in 1876. It shows a traditional Sunday for the Paris working class. On this day of rest, people would dress up in their finest clothes and meet in public squares for dancing and pastry. It was a day of celebration and happiness, a break from the grueling work week. 
Renoir truly captured the feeling in this work. The rich color and bright lights fill the scene. He is short upward brushstrokes to add a sense of frenzy, drawing from the dancing couples. There is an energy in this work that makes the viewer smile. One unique thing about this piece is its lack of focus. Typically, there's a central scene that the eye is drawn to, but in this work, it floats around between the dancers, the seated people, and those who are standing. It's meant to remind us of the atmosphere that Renoir is trying to capture. The final work of this video was painted by American artist and expatriate James McNeil Whistler. It has two names. The first is the arrangement in gray and black number one, but that isn't commonly used. Almost every art enthusiast knows it as, quote, Whistler's mother. Whistler painted this in 1871 and has almost taken on a life of its own. Not only is it one of the most famous American works that resides outside of America, but it has earned the nickname of Victorian Mona Lisa. This work wasn't originally planned to be of Whistler's mother. The artist never stated for sure, but a few stories have surfaced. Many believe that the actual model never showed up for her job. And then when Whistler's mother went to stand in, she got uncomfortable, so he painted her sitting in a chair instead. Either way, this position combined with the austere color palette and clean lines created an iconic work that symbolized motherhood. The Musée d'Orsay is a magnificent museum filled with 19th century artistic treasures. Remember, these are only five of the masterpieces of this collection. There are many, many more. I have a sixth one on Instagram, so don't forget to check it out. Mm -hmm.